Welcome to Wiki Africa Hour, where Africa's Wikimedians talk to, learn from, and discuss with each other topics they choose. Each session is curated by African Wikimedians to expand Africa's open movement. Today's host is Ceslas Obanyaya. Hello, everyone, and friends of Open Movement. It's my pleasure to once again welcome you to the episode 12 of Wiki Africa Hour, which is titled, Who is Mariana Iskander? This episode marks the one year anniversary of Wiki Africa Hour. And the fun fact is that uh, we actually started uh, like a year ago with the former CEO of uh, Wiki Media Foundation in the person of um, Kachima. And uh, we are glad that we are marking our one year anniversary with another Wiki Media Foundation CEO and the person of uh, Mariana Iskander. Isn't that great? Um, Cesla of Sobunaya, um, your host. It's been four months since Mariana Iskander launched her or concluded her listening tour and started her CEO role at the Wikimedia Foundation. A lot has happened uh, since the, of course, past four months, especially in her life, her current role specifically, and of course, her career in entirety. Today, we shall be engaging her on some subjects, like how she made it this far in, in her career, up to the current uh, activities that she is engaged in, her future plans and inspirations for the movement as the CEO of Wikimedia Foundation, and any other interesting subjects you feel like having her address during the Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, she's a lawyer and um, a social entrepreneur, she was a CEO of the Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator and a former COO of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America in New York. She's currently the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. Please welcome our very special guest, Mariana Iskander. Hello, I'm so happy to be here with you and to be in Africa with you. Yes, I, I was actually thrilled when you mentioned in your email uh, that you are actually going to be joining us from Africa. And that, that is amazing, guys. I guess uh, she's not all gone to the U.S. after all. <laughs> no, I'm welcome, at, at welcome. home. Yeah, at oh, home you're at home. That's, that's a very uh, beautiful fact to know. Uh, so um, let's just dive into it, uh, Mariana. Starting with the question of the hour, of course, uh, who is Mariana Iskander? Uh, tell us about yourself, what excites you, and you know, what keeps you going? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I have been looking forward to this conversation with you for many months. And as I said, very grateful we could do it when I am at home on African soil, uh, calling in from Johannesburg. The question of uh, who is Mariana Iskander, it's not one I uh, think a lot about, but I guess I, guess I represent um, the top and the tail of Africa. I'm Egyptian by birth. I was born in Cairo. Uh, I grew up mostly in the U.S., um, sprinkled in some British education, I suppose, for good measure. And I am now proudly South African. I've lived in South Africa for the last decade of my life call it home. I am also a sister, an older sister, and an aunt, and those are identities I feel very proud of uh, and are important to me. I would say that I like um, part of making big aspirational things be true and happen. Um, and when I think about the world as it is now, we have so many institutions um, formal or informal, whether it's governments or companies or others, that uh, it's hard to see sometimes how to move from big ideas to making change on the ground and doing things that um, break down barriers and increase access. And I think those are the kinds of things that excite me the most and that have motivated uh, my life and my career. So I suppose that's what excites me. Wow. <laughs> That's, that's quite, um, I mean, symbolic when you said 
you represent the the head and the tail. And the other way you've gone about uh, telling us who Mariana Iskander is, I don't think I would mind being Mariana Iskander for one day and be this awesome person you just introduced. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for, for that interesting response. And uh, moving to the next line of uh, question, um, you have, of course, had quite a career before taking up this current uh, role as a CEO of Wikimedia Foundation. Talk about uh, having served as a clerk at Diane P. Wood, uh, advisor to, the, uh, to President David Lebron of Rice University and the CEO of Planned Parenthood, just to mention but a few. Looking back at the travel you've had, that of course uh, led up to this point of you being the CEO of Wikimedia, what has been the motivation behind your career choices? Um, I love the question. So thank you again. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share about myself. Um, I did a podcast recently with other colleagues in the movement, uh, Inspiring Open, to talk about pathways and to talk about journeys. And it made me remember that most of us um, get opportunity usually because somebody creates an opportunity for us. And that's been very true of my career as well. I think one reason I've spent so much time focused on youth unemployment in Africa is because I've understood that if somebody doesn't help open a door um, and create opportunity for people who have enormous talent and can do, can do well, it's very hard um, for promises to be true about, you know, working hard and then having uh, opportunities present themselves. So when I think about my choices and my career, you know, it's been probably two big themes. I think one is um, how do you break down barriers and, and create access for more people? And certainly my time at Harambee has been about that. So I think, you know, your listeners and viewers across the continent will know that the promise of working hard and then you'll be able to get a job is not true. It's not true for millions and millions of young Africans. And so how do you think about the many things that make that not true, whether it's about changing practices in businesses, whether it's about creating entrepreneurship opportunities. And I think one common theme that's true in my prior work and is definitely true in Wikimedia is that for these very big societal challenges, no single organization can ever solve it alone. You have to do it with others. And you know the, the, the proverb that certainly uh, has been true for my career is you can go alone to go fast, but you can only go far if you go together. And I think that the idea of creating spaces where people can come together to increase opportunity and break down barriers um, has been, yeah, my motivating kind of inspiration. And if we think about the world as it is now, you know, it needs the work of Wikimedia more urgently than ever before. That's been a theme that's come through in my first few months. I think societies, certainly on the continent, but around the world are in need of what we are aspiring to do, to provide access to knowledge, uh, to provide access to information, um, to do things that, again, uh, empower people. Um, to build and live the lives that they want. Uh, and so in some sense, I feel very lucky to have a chance to keep doing those kinds of things that motivate me um, in this new world. Interesting story behind uh, the reasons why you've chosen the line of career you follow up until now. One might as well think there is a Mariana Iskanda HR consulting or human capital development firm <laughs> somewhere. Perhaps, perhaps I, you, could, you could throw that line when you are way done uh, with the regular corporate world. <laughs> Thank you. I Thank love you. talking to people about their. I love talking to people about their careers and choices because I again I think that um, oftentimes we're told there's only one path forward, and my experience is that there are always many cross-cutting paths maybe to even get to the same place. So anybody who wants to talk about careers, I love that topic. 
Beautiful. So we are seeing a Mariana consulting tomorrow. Interesting. No, no consulting. No consulting. I'm happy to do it. Happy to do it for anybody. Sure. sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for mentioning those uh, amazing points. And uh, to move to the next question, uh, beyond those trades, uh, what was the key factor that made you think, oh, this Wikimedia position is actually the next? And at what point did open knowledge uh, become a thing for you, since you mentioned inspiring open? Yeah. I mean, I would say that the concepts and um, motivations behind open have been in my life since the beginning. I think, again, when you think about opportunity, you think about access, you think about um, how to give more people a chance to live the lives they want. Those are all the same themes. And so in some sense, it feels very familiar to be part of this um, incredible movement in this world. I will say I had a lot of new things to learn for sure. It, uh, it's probably been a wild ride in terms of getting to know some of the um uh, amazing complexity uh, of the Wikimedia world. Um, and I would say that the, you know, for me, the chance to be a part and, you know, uh, a part with many, many other people to give the world and give societies and frankly, young people who, you know, are a, a, a group very close to my career and my heart is like, give people an opportunity, as I said, to shape their own paths. And so coming into Wikimedia has felt very familiar in some ways, social movements that try to harness technology, that understand that people plus technology is a very powerful combination. Um, the diversity of how to do that, I think, has also been something that's felt familiar and amazing. And I think that the, you know, the idea of... Um, the idea of open as also being about continuous improvement and continuous learning, I think has really resonated for me and something that's made this place, I think, feel particularly special. Awesome. It's, it's glad to know that this this is, um, how do I say, a heartfelt uh, commitment from you to us. In fact, it's, 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 it's safe to say you, you had this coming or it's been a long time coming and now you are here. Great. Great to know that, Mariana. And before you started your CEO role at uh, Media Foundation, you had about uh, 19 listening tours, uh, listening to various communities from about 55 different countries. I enjoyed the one you had with the Wikimedia Nigeria. What moments uh, stay with you uh, four months later? Well, any of you who watched the video of um, the welcome that I got with the Wikimedians of Nigeria, I hope saw what was absolute joy of experiencing that particular uh, community and those volunteers and what they had and wanted to share. I mean, maybe just to back up a bit, my um, announcement as the CEO of Wikimedia happened in uh, the middle of September. And I think that I had a deep appreciation for one, needing to learn about um, a new set of challenges and certainly uh, a wide and varied uh, set of communities. Um, so I had a lucky opportunity, mostly because my transition leaving my former role at Harambi, where I had been for about 10 years, was happening um, very smoothly and gave me some capacity to be able to get ready for uh, Wikimedia before my formal start date, which was only in January of this year. And so it was the idea of trying to just actually listen before I acted, try to learn before I made decisions, try to understand again who uh, these volunteers were and how issues showed up um, in different parts of the world. And so over the course of a few months, um, I was lucky to be able to join several regional events that were already underway and grateful to all of those organizers who made space for me to join the various regional forums around the world and then um, engagements with various groups. So at the end of it, we uh, talked to folks from 55 different countries, all regions of the world, um, 
probably close to about 300 uh, people and then another seven or 800 people in terms of um, the various events. The, uh, the Nigerian uh, event definitely stands out. I can't say enough how much energy and joy was in um, that particular call. But you know what I also really remember as standout uh, moments are, you know, the stories that people tell you about how they first got involved um, with Wikimedia. Sometimes it's a story about somebody's first edit. I actually love those stories. I, I often remember what people's first edits are because they remember, and it's something that they uh, hold on to as uh, the thing that brought them into this world or into this universe. I also feel like um, standout moments of the stories that people told about things they were really proud of, whether it was organizing editathons or um, in the case of a volunteer that I spoke to from India, her love for butterflies. And, you know, when people talk about sharing knowledge and creating knowledge in a way that speaks to their heart, you know, you can see it and feel the passion. And maybe the last point, Sislaus, that I want to make is that I feel very appreciative of the multilingual nature of our movement and that we have to enable people to speak in the languages that most give them voice and most give them authenticity and passion. And I learned from the listening tour that it's very easy to talk with support of an interpreter, let people speak in the languages they want, and you can feel what they're saying, even if it takes a while for an interpreter to help you understand the words. You can feel in people's expression and ways of communicating what they're trying to say. And so I think that those um, were some of the experiences and memories that I took from the listening tour that have really stood with me. Especially the, with the multilingual context of the community. One, one who I, I, I don't know, but that's probably your, your, your biggest uh, multilingual event, if I would say. And it, it sure could make a mark. It sure could make a mark. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana. And uh, you, you are currently uh, entering the, the, the fourth month on, on the job as CEO. There are some of us, actually, uh, even amongst our audience, who dream to someday become CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, please share with us uh, what your daily CEO routine is like and how you balance that with your personal life. Is, is this still the dream job, like you explained? What can you say about this CEO job so far? I mean, again, I said earlier, I love talking to people about their career journeys. And so if people want to become CEOs and even CEOs of the Wikimedia Foundation, I'd be happy to think about what pathways kind of get you there. I would say a few things. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation is a very global organization with staff that are scattered all over the world. While that is really important for our mission. I have to say it's hard to know it's hard to know when you're not working because at every hour of the day somebody in, somewhere in the world is doing work for Wikimedia. And so it's certainly been um, an adjustment to learn how to operate in such a global and um, distributed space because um, yeah, everybody's working every somebody's working every hour of every day. and so for me to try to, manage that and be present, but also take care of myself is certainly a challenge, not only I, but many others in the organization, and I'm sure many of you face. I would say that um, I don't have any big secrets um, on how to take care of myself. I think there are a lot of the things that most people focus on, family and sleep, which by the way, is one of the most important things to do is to make sure you sleep properly. Um, and so for, for me, the four months have been very intense, for sure, learning a lot, trying to uh, ensure that the priorities that I had set for um, this first phase are on track, um, learning how to do that, as I said, in a highly global uh, context. And uh, again, for some of you in the movement, you've had more practice managing your work across many time zones than even me. So one thing that's been actually wonderful about being in this part of the world is that I've had an opportunity to spend more time with um, volunteers and staff that are in Africa and sort of common time zones. 
and have learned a lot of tricks from them uh, on how to manage your life when uh, you're working with folks, again, who are spread from Asia all the way through to San Francisco. With the fact that we are all um, scattered around different time zones, and yet there is this uh, central figurehead who somewhere or the other has to <laughs> keep tabs on what goes on in these various regions. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for that answer. And uh, Mariana, during your first, um, do I call that official interview after your appointment as CEO, you mentioned that one of your priorities will be increasing diversity among the Wiki community volunteers. What does inclusion and diversity mean to you? And why is this so important? What practical steps can be taken, of course, in short term, and what are the long-term goals? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think for me, diversity uh, and inclusion is ongoing everyday work. It's not a initiative. It's not a thing that happens and then you're done with it. It's about mindset. It's about a way of working and a way of being that is really in the words of our vision, you know, creating an opportunity for uh, all people to contribute to the sum of knowledge. And so, you know, for me, I think that the starting point for diversity and equity sits in our own vision statements and our mission. And it doesn't feel like uh, anything other than doing the work of the mission and doing the work of achieving um, this pretty incredible vision for humanity and for the world. I would say that translating that into everyday work is hard and takes, I think, a lot of um, focus, commitment, accountability, resources. What I feel most inspired by is how many good things are already happening to welcome new people into this movement, whether it's work on specific communities or specific knowledge gaps, whether it's you know pilots like the ones we learned about in the Nigeria call uh, around how to document knowledge in new and innovative ways. So what I think for me is about practical short-term is that many things are already working. And so how do we scale them further? How do we do more of the things that are already proven to be effective um, in diversifying contributors? I also think that we have to be very um, open about what contributions look like. And so of course, uh, the edit count is a critical and important metric. I think that um, I heard from a lot of volunteers, particularly on the continent, about the struggles that they have when time is limited and they want to engage in community activities that might bring other people in, or they might want to connect to young people and bring them into the world of Wikimedia, and that the trade-offs on the time to do that versus the time to edit is a real um issue in terms of recognizing and making all of our contributions count. Maybe the last point to make is that I think ensuring that the work that we do across this movement is relevant to what's needed in a particular place. Maybe it's a region, maybe it's a country, maybe it's a community, maybe it's a group of people. And so a lot of the work we've been reflecting on at the foundation is how to have a more decentralized approach, a more regionalized approach that's happened already in some of our work so that we don't ever assume there's like a global solution to anything. I think that they're unlikely uh, in our world is a global solution to everything. And so part of welcoming new people is also understanding what is needed where they are. And I think the, the idea of meeting people where they are, not waiting for them to come to you is gonna be critical in how we show up in our work and show up in the initiatives that are that are happening. So those would be just some some reflections. Especially um, the, the point that we don't have to use the one size fits all approach as each and every one of our 
community that is located across the globe would, of course, vary uh, from one or, or from one another eventually. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, response. And then also, your predecessor. Sorry. Okay. Can I just say one, can I just say one thing? Just one thing. Sure. That that is true, but also what I think is amazing is how much there is in common across mm -hmm. projects and people. And I saw that really in the listening tour when you see that actually many communities who may look very different have quite common challenges and have quite common aspirations. And I think that trying to make sure that diversity and equity and inclusion also brings us together, also finds the things that are common amongst us is really an important point to make. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> yes, that's like um, hitting the nail on the head with the unity in diversity that actually exactly. exists amongst our community members. Yes, that's very evident from Nigeria to Kenya to Uganda and uh, all communities spread across the world. Yes. And uh, moving to the next question, uh, your predecessor, uh, Kachima, once said in her interview, and I quote, I wish my successor would come from the future of knowledge. Mariana, how do you feel about this particular statement? Well, I'm not familiar with the quote, so I don't know if there was a specific context in which um, Catherine said that. But I do acknowledge that um, her commitment to these same issues, how to increase representation, how to ensure that new voices uh, were brought into the movement, whether it was from communities and regions all over the world or the role of women. So I feel fortunate uh, to have had some of that ground uh, laid ahead of time before I arrived. But just to, to, to further give you context around uh, the, the situation in which she made that, that was, uh, I think she was basically talking about Africa and uh, mm -hmm. the op open movement. And uh, somehow she, of course, came up with that, that she wishes that her predecessor would come from the future of uh, free knowledge, if I would say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, let's let's move on to the next line of question. Uh, they, there actually seems to be a lack of diversified content so plaguing the Wikipedia. Some of the opinion that it's perhaps tougher publishing articles on, let's say, English Wikipedia, for instance, compared to other smaller language Wikipedia. Of course, this problem has existed way before you even came to be the CEO. What plans do you have to perhaps uh, better support communities towards creating more diversified content across the Wikipedia? I mean, I think I've learned enough at this point to understand that there is no single answer to that question because each of the language communities, and sometimes uh, if we're talking about knowledge gaps on language versions of Wikipedia, have approached this um, very differently. So in some cases, I've learned that communities are uh, more comfortable to rely on technology and on translation tools and other communities. That's not what they think is the best route uh, to expand um, the contributions that they want to make. I think that how um, technology and tools enable people to be able to contribute, whether it's on mobile, whether it's using different features. And so while there has to be, I think, some founding pillars that, you know, make us and bind us into one movement, the question of how gaps get closed, the question of how content gets um, created, for me, feels more like providing a set of tools and a set of pathways that communities can pull from and put together and use and try that best meets their context and best meets the challenges that they're trying to face. As I said earlier, what I find interesting is even amongst all of that, um, there are many common many commonalities. And I guess, again, that's sort of what keeps me the most inspired and gives me hope. Interesting. Uh, I just wish we can harness much more 
than the already existing approaches, like you mentioned. It could be just translating why some uh, communities agree, some don't. But hopefully, hopefully, at the, at the long term, we as community members, we hope to, of course, find a workable and lasting solution around that. Yeah. And last week, you, you shared the um, three months update on the mailing list. You talked about the Wikimedia Foundation's uh, annual plan needing deliberate two-way planning. Please share more light on, on this. Sure. Well, maybe just to give a little bit of context, um, I had finished the listening tour at the end of um, last year, 2021, and then took an opportunity to try to reflect and share all the things I heard from hundreds of Wikimedians, again, kind of all over the world. When I started in January, I published a letter um, to volunteers and to communities to try to say, these are the things that I heard and these are uh, checking. I'm checking if I've heard the right things. And so it was good to get uh, good to get feedback. And in that uh, process, as Laos, I identified a few priorities for the first few months of my time at the Wikimedia Foundation. And the top priority was really about reimagining how we do planning. Now, those of you who are, are in workplaces or parts of other organizations or even with affiliates and user groups know that there are many, many different ways that organizations can approach planning. And I'm not sure that there is one perfect way, but how you plan can say a lot about your values. It can say a lot about what your intent is and what you're trying to achieve. And my experience is that maybe sometimes the foundation's plan gets presented in a one-way kind of information sharing. Um, and I want to change that. I think that uh, we are a collective of communities and organizations, whether it's user groups, whether it's individual editors, whether it's volunteers. And instead of only saying, here are the things that the foundation is planning, we'd like to ask what other people are planning. We'd like to look at other people's priorities. And again, I think this will be an experiment. I hope it works. We'll see um, if there are good ways to invite others who obviously have to do their own planning to share their priorities with us. Maybe that'll help us visualize together what all of the different activities are in the movement. Maybe it'll help us identify more opportunities for collaboration, um, whether that's around a project or another area of interest or a language community. So that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to have conversations in which we'll share the highlights and the themes uh, of the foundation's plan, but also try to be very intentional and make space for others to tell us about their plans as well. That's a very um, interesting approach. Uh, perhaps, like you said, the, the experiment could pay off and I'm sure that at our various um, community levels, they are actually um, those who have, of course, planned how they want to run maybe the first quarter, second quarter, and all that. So bringing all that together could could really chart out a new path for the Wikimedia movement. Thank you so much for that interesting answer, Mariana. And um, in the annual plan, you you mentioned uh, strengthening the movement governance and health by supporting priorities like the Movement Charter, the Universal Code of Conduct, and the Movement Strategy implementation. What do you think of the results of the vote on the enforcement guidelines for the UCOC? It's a great question. I think that the importance of the Universal Code of Conduct, I think uh, for me, and certainly coming into the movement and learning about this as such an important priority, is critical. It's about creating a welcoming environment for all contributors to Wikimedia projects. And what I heard from, you know, I met with volunteers who I think have not felt welcomed and who have um, struggled as they've tried to join some of our projects. I think in terms of the most recent enforcement uh, mechanism vote, we had good participation levels. I think we had a, just over uh, 2,200 people who voted representing uh, over 137 communities. And part of the vote, which for me represents an important part of our movement strategy, is that there were hundreds and hundreds of comments that provided valuable feedback 
on what people wanted to say beyond just casting a yes or a no vote. And if you look at the movement strategy recommendations, recommendation number 10 talks about uh, iteration and learning. And for me, embracing that fully in all of the work we do is important. So now that we have a chance to learn from not only the vote, but the input in the comments, the board uh, will be asking the drafting committee to reconvene and review this feedback and work with communities to make sure that we're not just um, getting it done, but we're getting it done well and getting it done right. And so I think now allowing those next steps of the process to proceed uh, are going to be very welcomed. Yeah, because um, despite the outcome of, of, of the vote, we we had voices, comments, and suggestions from community members. And the, the, the fact that there is a, con a consideration to, of course, look uh, beyond the vote that has happened, that's to, to show that as a movement, we are interested, like you said, in getting it done well and not just getting it done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that good news because it's basically good news to us. And uh, to, to ask the next question around the um, conversations on the annual plan. Uh, I, I understand they are scheduled for 23rd, 24th, and 27th of April. What do you hope could be achieved during these conversations? Well, we started by asking who wanted to have conversations and not assuming everybody did. And so also trying to make sure that we're going places where there's an interest uh, to engage. And I think if we discover that there are additional spaces or additional communities that want to engage, you know, the conversations can absolutely continue. The objective of at least the first ones are to try to, again, take a regional lens, take a multilingual lens to some of our planning to be able to bring people together, some of whom already work closely together. And as I said earlier, really ensure that it feels like uh, a two-way conversation, sharing some of the foundations plans, which are much more tied to our movement strategy, making sure that a focus on knowledge equity and the concepts of knowledge as a service, which were part of the strategic direction um, of our movement strategy, better inform our implementation, help us understand how to shape some of our work. So as you mentioned, we'll, I'll be spending the weekend um, engaged in some of those calls tomorrow, uh, the day after, a few next week. But in addition to that, because I'm mindful that not all volunteers have time to be on calls, it's not uh, everybody has to contribute the best way they can, is we've made a and I hope a helpful change of providing on wiki opportunities for feedback on the foundation's annual plan. That's been done not only in English, but in several other languages. And so for those who may not have time or interest in participating in a call, certainly can provide their feedback and input on wiki and through other mechanisms as well. I would, of course, be attending the, the conversation sessions so as to learn more around the annual planning. And I recommend that those of us who, who keep tabs and be free around the schedule should also attend, as it is our collective responsibility to build our movement. Thank you so much, Mariana. And my, my last question for you is, when you first ha heard about the Wikimedia movement, you probably had your perception about it. If you could say a thing or two to your pre-wiki self, what would you say? Well, I would say that it has, uh, it's an adventure. Of course, I had heard of and was an active reader and engager of the content of Wikipedia. I'm not sure that most people in the world aren't in that bucket, as we know from, uh, from our own statistics in our own data. I think what I found most interesting is, again, discovering all of the different entry points into this movement. And so while Wikipedia is um, 
the most used or maybe the most known, that in fact, many other projects provide different and varied entry points, whether it's um, commons or Wikidata or Wikisource or Wiktionary or other projects that allow people to follow their passions um, and to find their way into the free knowledge ecosystem in a way that speaks to who they are. And so I think a lot of my pre-Wiki self um, might not have known the names of those specific projects, although I'm learning fast. I would say that what, um, what, what has made this, I think, again, feel like uh, so much discovery is that I think we have to create as many different entry points into the free knowledge ecosystem and allow people to make the contributions that they want in line with what interests them and, and what they want to share um, uh, and engage with in the world. That's very relatable uh, because myself, for instance, I actually didn't know it was this, let me quote you, adventurous <laughs> until I got in and then I hear about commons, I hear about uh, Wiktionary, I hear about Wikipedia and, and what have you. And it, it's, it's really interesting uh, hearing you say that to your pre-wiki self. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mariana. You've, you've really uh, done justice to the questions that uh, have been raised. And uh, hopefully uh, someone from the audience would have a question or, or two or more for you as well, we move into the Q&A section of the Wiki Africa Hour episode 12. And now uh, we welcome anybody from the audience who has any question for Mariana Iskander to address. Please go ahead and ask your question and we'll stream it and pull it up to be answered. Oh, okay, here is one from Bobby Shabangu. Bobby is asking, what has been the common theme in terms of challenges throughout your listening tour? Well, it's nice to have a question from a fellow South African. So thank you, Bobby, for being here and joining the call. You know, when I reflected back on um, the listening tour and the, I described them as puzzles because mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know the answers. I think we're all gonna have to figure out the answers together. And when you think about how much easier it is to solve puzzles when many people are doing it together, which I think is the wiki way. There were a few themes of common challenges. So the first was people who felt worried about how inward looking perhaps the movement uh, can be or has become. And uh, a real interest in wanting to make sure that we're facing outward and into the world and making sure that we understand, again, what does the world need from us now? And are we adaptable? Are we able to change? Are we able to ensure that what we do responds to what's needed? I would say that the second theme, which I referenced earlier, is this idea of how to make all contributions count, and particularly volunteers in communities that have joined Wikimedia, maybe not since day one. How do we make all different kinds of offline and online contributions have value uh, and be meaningful. A third set of challenges, uh, which were pretty common, um, have to do with our product and our technology and trying to ensure that, again, it's responsive to uh, global needs, that it is responsive to um, what our users want. Again, an important theme from our movement strategy and then Bobby, the last challenge that was quite common uh, in what I heard on the listening tour was again, a call for the multilingualism that's needed in our movement. And that it can't be that speaking English is the only way to engage in our governance conversations. I feel like even in the most recent votes that have been done both for elections and for the UCOC, we keep trying to make sure and improve the ability and opportunity for people to participate in their own languages and making sure that we aren't multilingual in name only, but in reality, because what's amazing about Wikipedia and Wikimedia is that it is the most multilingual project in the world. 
it's uneven, it's unequal, but making sure that the multilingualism is also an important part of the work that we do. I would say that more on an individual level, I heard many volunteers from, again, different countries, but the same theme, worried about burning out, worried about how to stay engaged, worried about how to bring young people into the movement, worried about how to connect to the issues that are most important and that would attract more new people into not only the movement, but into free and open knowledge uh, in the world. So those kinds of themes, I think, were quite common uh, across people at an individual level as well. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, Bobby, I hope that addresses the um, answers or the question that you asked. Let's see if uh, someone else has a question for you from our audience. Oh, there is Wayezu Kote. Uh, he's asking, uh, firstly, I appreciate you for everything. And what an advice or what advice can you give to newborn communities in the movement? He's asking well, for one, by the way. Yes, I was. I saw that. I did. Um, yes. I did a, a lot of work in my prior job in Rwanda and know Kigali well, and I think that there are uh, many opportunities to think about for Rwanda in particular how to again fit into a bigger ecosystem. What are the partnerships that can be formed? If I think about Rwanda with educational institutions when I think about the number of young people that are there, what are ways to get them interested and excited in the open movement. I noticed that when the announcement came out about the community in Rwanda being formed, there were a lot of messages of support. And so I think a practical um, advice is to follow up on all of those people who said they wanted to help and can offer expertise and can offer mentoring, can offer knowledge um, from other communities, uh, both on the continent and elsewhere that have been um, uh, at it for a little bit longer. I certainly think that we have a number of well-developed communities and volunteers in Africa that I think would lend a hand uh, to our compatriots in Rwanda happily. Awesome. Uh, Kote, I hope that answers your question. And uh, Bobby has, oh, another question yeah. for you, Mariana. Your South, Africa, yeah. <laughs> your South African brother is being us proud. Says, yeah. and by the way, have you edited Wikipedia and how do you find it? What's your favorite uh, Wikimedia project and what do you edit about? Yeah, so I've, I've been asked this question before, and um, the answer is the same. So in trying to talk about how to make all contributions count, I've tried to live that myself. And uh, in the past few months, it's not just about learning how to ed edit Wikipedia. I'm definitely in the newcomer category, spent time with the product and tech team uh, at the foundation, trying to make sure that at least I'm learning about what the new editor tools are. But I think that, and Bobby knows this, um, that the contributions that are about affiliate activities, chapter activities, I wouldn't say I have a favorite project, although I have been really trying to understand, as I said earlier, how all of our big projects fit together, not only Wikipedia, Commons, Wikisource, Wikidata, and making sure that the triangle of contribution across all of those um, matters. We have identified an opportunity to get specific input on commons. And so I've probably been spending a little bit more time there in the last, uh, in the last few weeks if, if, I, if I give an honest answer. OK. You still give us your favorite, which is commons. <laughs> for now. Interesting. <laughs> OK, for now, your favorite for now. Well, we're working on it. We're working on it is probably the right answer. Okay, okay, interesting. And Ayla is pulling up a community question. Yeah. Uh, should the Wikimedia Foundation be involved in fixing the consequences of the no open progress policy and implementing of policy? And if so, how? I mean, it's, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't know the answer to that one because it's a technical debate that I'm following closely, certainly have been 
reading all of the messages that have come since Flo raised this on uh, the mailing list, it seems that some parts of the solution have to lie with communities and have to lie with others as it becomes clearer. And again, I've got to rely on others who uh, certainly have more technical expertise than I do. If there are roles for the foundation to play, what are they? And again, what feels um, both appropriate and actually solves um, the issues that are being raised? So that may not be satisfactory, but my most honest answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kanga, Kanga the Latin, his coffee. Yeah, it's He's the same asking, topic. I want to know your approach. Yes, that's basically the, the same topic because of the uh, IP blocking, yeah. which has affected a lot I mean, of the issue, Africa yeah, the issue is groups. very clear. I know you're interviewing, I know you're interviewing me, but if anybody on the call has anything they want to share uh, on this topic, I'm very also happy to make space for that as well to, to add other voices. I know I'm the subject of the interview, but anyway, we can, um, we can continue the IP block issue on the mailing list, as Flo says. She started it there, but I've been, I, I hope, Flo, you've also been happy with the levels of engagement um, and problem solving that has come just since you sent the, sent the first message. Oh, yes, I, I agree. We could continue that there. And then another common question. Um, yep. So several African user groups cannot receive funding from Wikimedia yep. Foundation due to the various regulations and complicated relationships between the USA and their countries. I think I know Egypt is on this list. Any thoughts on how to deal with this situation in the future? Well, I'm glad you said that because I've heard about this issue uh, in other regions of the world, but I hadn't heard it uh, in the context of African countries. So to be honest, it would be useful to know which ones and what the issues are instead of having a kind of broad generic answer, because the broad generic answer is we should make sure to find solutions. In some cases, what I've seen, not in Wikimedia, but in other parts of the world, is there are ways to use fiscal sponsors and hosts and others to abide by, obviously regulations that have to be abided by, but ensure that resources are able to reach the communities um, where they're needed. So I guess I'd, I'd be interested to learn if there are other specific examples. I have also heard of this, um, uh, not in Egypt, but in other countries in the Levant, uh, where we actually had a conversation with some of the more active volunteers there uh, around how they've tried to think about other problem solves um, that involve fiscal hosts and, and sponsors. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that. Um, oh, Flavon said, indeed, very happy with the engagement and surprised oh, to yeah, see that great. others yeah. beyond Africa were concerned. Yeah. Thank on you, Flavon. Yeah, on the IP blocking. Yeah, yeah. yeah on the IP blocking. Oh, Ayla is pulling up another community question, and it says, what Okay, some African editors mentioned the risks for editors in authoritarian regimes. Unfortunately, worldwide risk, but seems to be more frequent in some African countries. What can the Wikimedia Foundation do to decrease those risks? It's a really important question. I would say that the foundation's... Um, you know, highest priority has to be the trust and safety of contributors. And the, the growth of our trust and safety support and teams who also have been operating on a regional level, I think for me represents an important uh, answer to that question and ensuring that we are um, uh, where it is uh, possible to do so um, providing both direct and indirect support to individuals who find themselves uh, in these difficult situations. And again, ensuring that trust and safety remains at, at very high on the priority list. I would say that there are, and I've seen it since even just in the last few months, I think there are some community solutions that can be shared across regions of the world where situations may be similar. I mean, the regimes may be different, but the consequences are the same. And so trying to ensure that it's not it is what the foundation can do with its own resources, but also what the foundation can do to make sure that learnings around very difficult situations like this are actually shared um, and give us an opportunity uh, for improvements, um, not just in Africa, but and also, frankly, African solutions that can be shared 
uh, with other parts of the world uh, where those exist as well. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, thank you for that response. I don't know if we still have any question from the audience or community. Well, I, I, I know we only have so we five have minutes. That. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, some Sometimes it gets more interesting, like it is now, and <laughs> we tend to overflow a bit beyond the hour. Okay. In the absence of uh, any other question, I, I think I have one more, which is personally from me to you, Mariana. Yeah. And that question is, by the end of your tenure as uh, the CEO, uh, what do you hope that you would have achieved for the movement? I mean, I, I hesitate because I think my entire leadership philosophy is that nothing meaningful can ever happen with just one person. It's important to have leaders because people have to um, take accountability and people have to be responsible, but that can't be confused with leaders who think that they can achieve um, big things by themselves. And so I hope that uh, my time here is about that, about how to uh, empower and lift up um, not only our communities, but also my colleagues at the Wikimedia Foundation. I think brilliant people who are so committed to this work and want to be able to be in service um, of the mission and in service of the work that needs to be done. I think that when people uh, are activated and supported by technology, what I've seen uh, is that impossible things become possible. And I think that that is the call in our movement strategy. That's what we're trying to get to by 2030 is something that feels quite impossible. But I think that if humans are activated uh, alongside technology, we're going to be able to do things that we couldn't have imagined. And I suppose that that's maybe the legacy that I'd like to be a part of, uh, be a part of with many others. That's amazing and uh, very poetic, if I would say. But it's not impossible. Like you said, it, it could uh, look like a very challenging task. But by the end of it all, I actually hope to see this particular legacy standing tall amongst us as uh, Wikimedia movement and as, as community. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana. And uh, thank you to everyone who has actually asked a question that has helped us to get more, more insight around the movement activities. And we are moving forward now to the news uh, segments of this session. And uh, with me today on the news update is Noni Ntlaha. I hope I got it right. Hello, Noni. Hello. Oh, Noni, I think you... oh, Hi, I sorry. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, okay. yes, you can. And uh, thank you for accepting to, to do this. Uh, the first... Uh, updates I would like us to have is that the Wiki Loves Africa 2022 themed home and habitat ends on 30th of April 2022. You have five days to upload your visual celebrations of your home and community spaces. Over to you, Nani. The offline user group is glad to announce that the new versions of QX desktop have been released. And the virtual Wikipedia and multimodal and multilingual research workshop holds on 29th April at 2.15 Central European time. The community resources team and the Let's Connect working group are excited to announce the launch of the peer learning program, Let's Connect. And Wikimedia Deutschland is hosting the Wikimedia Summit 2022 on September 9th up to September 11th. It's going to be a hybrid event in Berlin and online. The application deadline has been extended to 24th April 2022. 
And the call for application for the Unlock Free Knowledge Projects is on until May 29th, 29th of 2022. Wikimedia Foundation's technical engagement team has developed a swag program for technical contributors in collaboration with the fundraising operations team. This program will reward technical contributors for their active participation in outreach programs, events, and software projects by giving swag. The Wikimedia Dutchland's movement strategy and global relations team is excited to announce the launch of Wikimove, a new podcast on all things movement strategy. And we are happy to share that uh, Meiman Ibrahimov, uh, Joy, Agie Pong and Benoit Prier have been appointed to be part of the Affiliations Committee. Joy Agie Pong is from the Ghana community. The Wikilab's Women Inspiring Open podcast has released up to three episodes now, one of which features the Wikimedia Foundation CEO, Mariana Iskander. And the third workshop on the topic of writing PY Wikibot scripts is coming up on Friday, April 29th at 1600 UTC. And lastly, the annual planning conversations with Mariana Iskandar will hold on Saturday, 23rd April at 1400 UTC and Sunday, 24th of April at 700 UTC and Wednesday, 27th of April at 1730 UTC, respectively. And you can find all these new news items and the action buttons in the newsroom section of the Wiki Africa Hour Meta page. Thank you, Noni. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to remind us that it is not a small task being CEO of the NGO Wikimedia Foundation, which powers the largest free encyclopedia on planet Earth. Today, Mariana Iskander has given us an insight into the world she lives in and wakes up to every day, how she handles her CEO job with her personal life and how she navigates the challenges of the Wikimedia Foundation towards, of course, finding lasting solutions for these challenges that affect us all as a movement. At this point, we all should rally around her to support her as much as we can and of course, criticize constructively at each point it becomes necessary. All of these towards building a better and formidable Wikimedia Foundation and open movement at large. On behalf of the Wiki in Africa team, I say a big thank you to you, Mariana Iskanda, for finding time in your very busy CEO schedule to honor our invitation. I also thank everyone uh, for showing up and Personally, I thank Meredad for doing the background work that made this uh, episode a success. And I remain your host, Cecil of Subunaya, and I wish you a happy weekend. See thank you, you next so time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having the me. Is ours. The pleasure is ours. This episode of Wiki Africa Hour was hosted by Seslas Obanaya. Let us know what topics you want to discuss and join us next month on the same channels. Subscribe to the Wiki in Africa YouTube channel and follow Wiki Africa on social media.